everyone. Right, so I'm feeling slightly nervous. I've got a five-page speech, but I've only got three minutes, so I'm going to ditch the written speech. Um, I wanted to firstly welcome you all here, and especially to our guest students from Reading, welcome to Newham. It's a really amazing, kicking, rocking place. And also to all the young people from the variety of secondary schools that we have here in the borough. And I need to give a special shout out to Forest Gate Community School because uh, my niece, my 13 year old niece um, attends the school and she tells me it's a very good place to be. So welcome. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't uh, feel or think great things about all the other secondary schools in the borough. And as some of you may know, I actually grew up in Newham. I went to school here. I made a number of friends here. I went to St. Stephen's School, Shaftesbury School, and then Plashett School. Oh my God, who went to St. Stephen's? Way! Okay, but I went a really, really, really long time ago. Okay, almost, I think, 40 years ago. Because uh, I'm two years away from being 50. Uh, half a century, so actually that's a really neat segue into congratulating the University College of Estate Management for their 100 year anniversary. And I wanted to really commend them for working with us to put this very important event on for all of you here. And the reason I say that is because when I was growing up, these kinds of opportunities weren't available for me. I had to uh, leave the borough uh, as I wanted to pursue a great variety of things. Um, but during the period that I was growing up, the only thing that was available, not that I'm knocking it, was a part-time job in McDonald's on East Ham High Street. And uh, the reason I'm not knocking it is because it's so important to uh, equip yourself with the skills and the aptitude uh, that you only really gain in a full sense in the world of work. And as you progress through the remaining period of your education journey at your secondary school, it's really, really important that you start thinking about what you want to do next. Learning is a lifelong endeavor, uh, and you should never give up on that but you should also be mindful about the way the world is changing. And with the onslaught of technology, the way in which we understand jobs in the here and the now are being massively disrupted. And by the time you're my age, the world of work will have fundamentally changed. It will mean potentially uh, fewer jobs, and people needing to think about different ways in which they can contribute to their communities and also their neighborhoods uh, without necessarily stepping into a job nine to five. Um, you will be experiencing a life journey of work where you will undoubtedly have a number of jobs and they call it a portfolio career. And you are going to need in this very difficult age uh, to demonstrate to employers and your work peers that you've got the skills, the aptitude, and the growth mindset to deal with a whole range of challenges that your organization, your company will face, but also uh, a whole series of challenges that the world faces today. And it neatly brings me on to the importance of the work that the University of College of Estate Management do. They educate, well presently they have some 4,000 students from around the world. Each year they invite, uh, interview and allow entry uh, for a range of different people from different backgrounds who are really interested in what is meant by place so you'll hear a lot of technical words this morning. You'll hear about the build environment. You'll hear about surveying. And no doubt you'll be scratching your head thinking, I'm not quite sure what that actually means or what relevance it has for me as I'm growing up here in Newham. And I tell you the relevance that it has 
the built environment basically is a posh word for how we approach building place. So the young uh, people that go to Forest Gate Community School, you'll walk through Forest Gate and others that might live in other parts of the borough will be traveling from say South uh, Newham, which is where we're currently uh, in the Royal Docks part of the, of the borough. And you'll be looking around on the top of the bus and thinking, why on earth did anyone think that designing this road in the way that they did or that building in the way that they did was right? So the built environment is profoundly important. It's about the way in which we approach uh, our understanding of place and how we create neighborhoods that enable people to live safely, healthily, and in a way that enables them to build connections with their neighbors. And if you decide after today's event that this might be an area that you'd be interested in pursuing, I'd very much encourage you to do that. When I stepped into the council back in 2014 as a councillor, I set on a committee called Strategic Development Committee, and basically that um, relates to all applications coming into the borough, relating to housing delivery or building offices. And it's one of the most interesting areas of specialism that you can get embraced and immersed in. You learn about the use of materials, the use of space, how you can maximize space to build some of the most beautiful homes for residents of Newham and residents elsewhere, and some of the most inspiring buildings where you can work. So I urge you today, ask as many questions as you can. Don't feel stupid uh, if you don't understand a word or a technical term. Ask the adult in the room to explain better for you. And I want to end by saying, uh, all of you here, uh, except our young people from Reading, where are you? Sorry, I'm looking up this way. Where are our pupils from Reading? Oh, they're not here. Okay. So all of you, <laughs> all of you here who um, go to a Newham school, I want to really just leave you with this thought. I stepped into office 12 months ago. Last week, I celebrated 12 months in the role. It's been a pretty challenging 12 months. I stepped into office after someone uh, who had run the council for 23 years, and I've had to undertake a huge program of change so that the council becomes more responsive for all of its residents, including its young people. I've placed a huge emphasis on all of our children and young people in the borough because I want Newham to become the best place in the world for a young person to grow up and live. And all of you in this room represent our amazing young talent. And I'm very much hopeful that as you progress through school and as you begin to uh, make decisions about what you will do next, that you will provide and make some huge contributions to the borough that we all call home, because I need you all to uh, contribute. This is your borough, I'm your mayor, I'm here to serve you and make sure that during my term in office, we get the business of the council right. I've invested just over 30 million pounds in youth services provision, including expanding our youth services and improving our youth hubs. We've got one in Forest Gates, we've got one in Custom House, we've got one in Little Ilford, and we've got one in Beckton. And I have pledged and promised that I'm going to double the number so there'll be four more. And I want these to become the most beautiful places that you can hang out in, a home away from home, a place of safety and a place of learning and a place of enjoyment, happiness and well-being. But I need something back from you. I need your commitment to helping me make Newham the best place in the world that it can be, not only for you, but for all the other children in this borough, because that's what you deserve, that's what they deserve, and that's what we're going to do. Thank you very much.
Uh, Lady Mayor, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your support for today's event. Um, it's great that you asked the question, you know, what is the built environment? And uh, you may not know the answer to that right now, uh, but hopefully by the time you leave here today, you'll have a much better uh, understanding uh, and we'll focus particularly on trying to answer the question, what is surveying? I really hope some of the four people behind me know the answer to that question. Um, so with that, let me introduce uh, your host for this morning's session, uh, Andrew Heinard. Uh, Andrew is a UCM trustee. Uh, he's also chief executive of the Howard de Walden Estate, uh, which he joined in 2016. Uh, that estate comprises 92 acres uh, of principally residential, medical, office and retail property uh, in and around Marlebone. Uh, it includes Harley Street and Marlebone High Street. Uh, prior to that, Andrew spent the majority of his career at Jones Lang LaSalle, one of the UK's biggest or the world's biggest agencies, uh, where he was UK Deputy Chairman. So he's very well qualified to tell you what a surveyor is, and with that I will hand you over to Andrew Heinard. Thanks, Ashley, and hi, everyone. Really good to see you. It's so nice to be seeing a bright, young audience and a full audience. I, I attend a few of these things, and usually they're rather grey people in the audience, suited and booted, a bit like us. And uh, so to have a full room, and uh, it, it's, it's super. And in such a lovely part of London, which has seen a huge amount of change. So as Ashley said, I'm Andrew. I'm very proud to be a charter surveyor. I'm very proud to be a trustee of University College of Estate Management. And what a trustee does is basically we support Ashley and his team at the university in giving a bit of guidance and our thoughts from our everyday perspective. So we're not paid, we're not employed by the university, but our, it's our job and our interest and our passion to really give some relevant insight to Ashley and his really excellent team of lecturers and other colleagues based down at Reading, who look after the 4,000 students. So it's something that we do on a voluntary basis, and we get enormous fun and benefit out of it, and we learn a lot as well. And Ashley mentioned that I look after a part of London, and Marlebone may not ring any bells to you, but I bet Madame Tussauds do, does. Yep, or Top Shop on Oxford Circus. It's that area. So that's, that's a lovely part of the world. And Harley Street's pretty well known because of the, the medical piece. So I've got about 100 colleagues. And between us, we do all sorts of property-related things to make that work at its best, to look its best, to provide space, the right sort of space for the occupiers. And it takes lots of skills. So I'm specialised in one part of the property world. But I've got other colleagues who are really good on buildings, other colleagues who are really good on planning, so they can talk to the local council and agree what type of space should go where. I've got other colleagues who collect the rent and so forth. So it takes a lot of skills. And today, and in this little session, I hope what we're going to find out and be able to get across to you is a bit of insight as to what the world of property involves. So I'm joined by three super guests, and they'll be taking us through their perspectives. They've got one thing in common, and that is they've all had involvement with the university College of Estate Management, and uh, we'll hear from them in a minute. Good to see you all got these blue things around your neck, which is the click and pad. Now, we're going to see if it works. And this is to help us get an idea of how much or how little anybody knows about surveying. So the first question I'd like to ask you all, and there are four, the four choices, answers one to four, how much do you know about what a surveyor does? A lot, that's one, quite a bit. Two, something, which is three, or nothing, which is four. So when you're ready, fingers on the buzzers, and please cast your vote. Okay. Ah, ah, ah. We should ask you the question at the end of this session and see, what, see if that changes at all. 
It's interesting. I'd like to know who the six uh, percent are, because we're looking for a couple of a couple of surveyors. So uh, come and have a chat with me later. Right. Let's move on to uh, another question. What is a surveyor? I won't read this all out because it's quite a lot. But work your way through the questions. Again, we've got a choice of four. And when you're ready, let's have your votes, please. Right. Now, that's pretty fair because, of course, all four of those subjects are part of a surveyor's role. It's a very, very broad profession, cover a lot of ground, and that's, that, that, that's good. We're a bit of everything, and we'll hear a bit more about that in a minute. And then we're on to the last question I'm going to ask you before we get into the really interesting bit. And that's what would you most like to get out of your career. So have a look. Read through. I quite like, I quite like the look of number nine, but don't let me influence you. OK, let's have your votes, please. Two seconds to go. Wow. <laughs> Travel the world. Well, there are definitely ways of doing that. And you'll, you'll hear a bit more about that in a minute. OK, well, thanks for taking part in that. That's excellent. And it's now time to introduce you to our first speaker. And uh, this is Jessica, Jess Austin. She is currently on one of our programs at UCEM doing the apprenticeship. And she's probably the closest to your age, so most relevant possibly in terms of being able to relate to her. And she's going to, for the next 10 minutes or so, talk us through what her work experience involves and how she's going about learning the world of property. Jess, over to you. Um, so hello, everyone. I'm Jess. Um, I, as Andrew said, am um, currently a student with UCM, but I'm not a traditional student in that I um, chose to pursue an apprenticeship. So I study part-time with UCM and work the rest of it. And I work for a property company called CBRE, and um, I work in our city office um, in London. So before I go into my background and how I got into it, um, we've got a question for you which is, I think, if I click there, um, what do you think is the best route to become a surveyor? Either go to university or get an apprenticeship. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm actually really pleased with that. Um, well done. <laughs> um, yeah, you can obviously do both, um, but I did an apprenticeship, so I'm going to be biased, and I think it's the best. Um, but obviously, you can do both. So you can do a degree apprenticeship is basically what I wanted, the point I wanted to make out of that. Um, so we were asked to put together some slides um, on... Um, some questions um, based around um, why I chose to become a surveyor, um, how I got into it, and I guess I just wanted to start off by saying, um, to me, a career in surveying is a real range of different things, but it's um, 
a global recognised qualification so you can travel the world. So to all those people that voted, they want to travel the world. You can, once you're a charter surveyor, you can go anywhere in the world and be recognised as a surveyor. Um, I work in central London and so to me a career in surveying is being able to shape um, the London skyline. Um, and that's one with the new building which is called the Tulip which has got planning permission now. So um, that will be our new London skyline in a couple of years. Um, and I've put a picture of a shopping centre there because as a surveyor you um, can work with companies such as Topshop and um, Primark and wherever you guys shop at the moment, you could potentially work with them and advise them on where to um, have their shops, whether that be in shopping centres, so in a Westfield or on the High Street, on Oxford Street, um, you as a surveyor would advise them on where to have their shop in different locations and what rent to pay, etc., etc. Um, and then also that's a picture of YouTube's office in London. And again, you could work with companies such as YouTube and advise them on where to have their office and how to fit it out and maybe um, go down the slide. Um, so I, this is a real snapshot of, of, my, of my diary. Um, and I just wanted to show you um, that it kind of, if I was your age, I would have been really nosy to see what people actually do um, at work. But you can see each day is totally different. Um, and I have one day out of the office where I'm at home working on university stuff. Um, and yeah, this is a true picture of a day in the life. On Thursday um, evening, I went to visit Battersea Power Station, um, which was awesome. Um, and yeah, I mean, it is really varied out on inspections. The good thing about um, being a surveyor is it's not a nine to five office job. So um, I will be out on inspections for some period of time. So you get out, you get to obviously have to go and see the buildings. Um, and then other days, like on that Friday, I was working on reports and presentations for clients. Um, so yeah. So why did I choose um, this career? Um, so the story of how I kind of found out what a surveyor was, um, I was sitting in your shoes um, thinking probably the things most of you might be thinking other than the 6% who say they know a lot about <laughs> what a surveyor is. Um, I had no idea what a surveyor was. Um, none of my family are in the property industry. Um, I would never have been able to tell you what a surveyor does and that um, there would be this amazing career that I could, that I am now living um, in the surveying um, world. And um, when I was 16 or 17, I attended the University of Reading Summer School, which is called the Pathways to Property Summer School. And you go there f and stay at the university for three days and you get to go out and um, do lots of project work. You get to meet loads of different people from different schools, stay on campus. Um, and it was there that I found out about this career in property. And I sort of, after that, went back to my school and was like, why have you never told me about this? And um, I was really frustrated that I'd never heard about what a surveyor was before. Um, so from there, I then got work experience with the company that I work for now. And I heard about the apprenticeship scheme. So then I applied for the apprenticeship, but then also did the whole UCAS application, applied to um, study um, to, to be a full-time student. Um, I had the option of both in the end. I was lucky enough to be accepted at uni. And um, yeah, I chose the apprenticeship scheme. Um, and so, I chose the apprenticeship scheme because I am someone who learns best through doing. Um, and, you know, with an apprenticeship scheme, you're working four days of the week at work. You're learning it hands on by people who are skilled and expertise in what they do already. And then you also then have that one day where you do your university work. Um, and yeah, it just it works really well. Um, so. A little bit about the apprenticeship route um, for any of you that are interested. Um, this is the one that my company offer. 
Um, but it's pretty standard amongst most of the property companies now. They do offer a degree apprenticeship, which is the top one. Um, so if you decide that you want to do your A-levels, um, then when you're 18, you can um, do the four-year route. So it's working, it's part-time degree for four years. Um, and then alongside that, in the final two years, you do what's called the APC, which is um, essentially the interview that you sit to make you a chartered surveyor. So um, the qualification that is going to make you recognised all over the world. Um, and then the five-year route, if you decide you want to leave school at 16, you could then do the five-year route where you do a BTEC for the first two years and then for the final three years you do um, university. So if, um, and both of these would get you to being a fully qualified charter surveyor. Um, and obviously the main thing about the apprenticeship scheme is that you'll be in no debt. So no student debt whatsoever and you're being paid to study for a degree. Um, and then finally, is it going to work? No? Ah, okay. Networking. It's kind of a big deal. Um, so uh, I was asked to speak about networking and how I believe it's um, a really good skill and quality to have. Um, to progress in your career um, and that's because I came into the industry at the age of 18 um, obviously not knowing anybody else in the surveying world um, and I had to really build up my um, internal network within the company that I work for but also externally so meeting people who are also within the property industry but outside of my company um, and that's why I think networking is is so is so important because when um, when you kind of compare coming into the industry at such a young age, you kind of have that advantage over graduates of where you kind of can just start meeting people um, and building up that network, whereas a graduate would be a bit later on. So um, the, the good thing about the property industry is that it is a very sociable um, industry and it's about getting to know people and, you know, sometimes it's not what you know but who you know. Um, so, yeah, so networking as Ron Burgundy says, would say, um, it's kind of a big deal. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Jeff, thank, thank you very much indeed. That was great. I just wanted to mention to everybody that we'll have lots of chances and opportunities for questions afterwards. So uh, save those up and you can ask Jess or anyone else up here anything you'd like at all. And in terms of timing, just to give you a heads up as to how we're doing, we're on schedule. Jess finished nine seconds ahead of uh, program, so well done. That's excellent. Um, and we're, we're going to have this session until about 12.15 or so, something like that. Okay, on to our next speaker. And I'm delighted to introduce Sharon, Sharon Amanese. Um, she's a bit of a boomerang because a boomerang is often referred to as somebody who's at an organization leaves, goes elsewhere, and then gets attracted back. So I was a bit confused when I was checking her out on LinkedIn. I saw that she was at Lendley's, and yet my briefing notes said, no, she was at the government. And in fact, what's happened, I discovered from chatting with her earlier, is that she has been at government, had a very important role there. Then she joined Lendley's in a senior role as head of offices. And Lendley's is an amazing global company. Uh, she'll tell us a bit about it, I'm sure, but they're an Australian business. And they've been heavily involved in a lot of the regeneration around the place, not least down at Stratford. But uh, she must have been good, or she must be very good, because the government have persuaded her to go back, so she's a boomerang. But we'll hear a bit more about uh, Sharon's experiences, and uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning. So I, I need you all to be in fine voice for my talk because I'm less technologically advanced uh, than my peers here. So good morning. Good morning. Once more, please. Good morning. Fabulous, fabulous. That's good to hear. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my career, but I also want you to be in fine voice because I note that a few of you around this part of the room and maybe over there are looking a bit tired. Hands up if you're feeling tired. Yeah, I thought so. You probably got up early this morning, didn't have enough breakfast. 
So, so there'll be some interaction. Right, who knows which two characters this come from? <laughs> Superman and Batman, yes, but from which film? Thank you, Lego Movie. Right, not too much audience participation, please. Thank you. Okay, so they, one of the things that obviously, for those of you who have watched, hands up who's watched Lego Movie and Lego Movie 2. Okay, middling, middling, at least those of you who are willing to own up to it. They're obviously their master builders and their architects. So I'm actually initially an architect uh, by profession. And obviously, as when, I was, when I was younger, actually, I still do now play with my kids' Lego. But anyway, um, I love the fact that they can transform things. And one of the big things for me, so even at my age, I enjoyed watching it, was they could actually transform the world that they were part of. And I thought that was an amazing thing. And that was one of the things that initially got me interested in actually pursuing a property in career, a, a, a career in property, which in my case was architecture. But of course, no career route is ever a straight line. And I put this here, which is a slightly warped map of the London underground system that effectively, you know, you can go from one station to another station, you can change, sometimes there's a signal failure, sometimes the train decides to die on you, and there isn't ever a clear path. It's very rare that you can go from one station to another station right to the end of the line, and that's the route that your career takes you. So a little bit about me, I came to this country at the age of six, and uh, I was born in Iran, I was born in Tehran, and I moved here during the midst of the Iran-Iraq war. And I actually remember having to go into basements when there were uh, air siren calls that there were bombing raids. And I came to this country only knowing three words of English, which was yes, no, and thank you. And I used them fairly interchangeably, so which probably meant that when I was in primary school, my social skills were uh, somewhat lacking, really. Um, if those are you know, only three words. So I've lived in London most of my life, and the reason I was drawn into a career in property was the transformative part of it. I wanted to make the world a better place, and property is one of the very few careers where you actually have a physical lasting legacy, whether you're a surveyor, which is what we're here to talk about today, whether you're an architect, whether you're more on the construction side, or whatever part of it you go to. But also, in terms of the changes that life brings on to you, you need to have resilience. So what I mean by resilience is that when change comes your way, to think about how you're going to be prepared for it. So I'm going to gently, there we go. So who, know, who, give me a guess, hands up please, rather than screaming out. Who thinks they know where this place is? Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, okay, good guess. Roughly the right part of the world. Another guess, please. Hands, 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 please. Person in the back. Pakistan, getting closer. So that's the right part of the world. It's um, lady right at the back. Sorry? Close. It's Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, right. Have, why do I have a slide of Saudi Arabia here? So I was talking about resilience. So I spent uh, the initial part of my career working for a company called uh, Farrells. The, um, the head of the company designed the headquarters for MI6. And then from there, I wanted to do more international projects. So a lot of you said you wanted to travel. Um, I traveled in Bahrain, in Dubai, a lot of the Middle East, in Russia, in America, and one of the projects I led was in Jeddah for the flood alleviation. Um, so I worked for the municipality of Jeddah, and it was a 130 square kilometre uh, project just to the north of Jeddah to stop the flooding. Now, most of you probably, if you don't know the country, wouldn't think that Saudi Arabia would flood, but believe me, it does. So one of the times that I was uh, there, 
I got to the place and it was raining. So I thought, yeah, I'm a Londoner. Rain doesn't mean anything. And then three days later, it was still raining. And I was in the local authorities' offices. And they said, you know what, Sharon, you need to go back to your hotel because it's a bit dangerous for you to be here uh, because you might get stuck in the floods. So come on, I've lived in London most of my life. I'm not scared of a little bit of water. Anyway, eventually they bundled me into a Toyota Land Cruiser. And as the water was rising, as you can see in the streets, higher and higher, we got stuck. So after a few hours, six hours of being stuck in a car, we decided that it was best to go to a place of safety because I couldn't go back to my hotel uh, because the overpass to the hotel had sadly collapsed and killed a number of people. So we needed to find somewhere that was dry and safe. So I started wading through the water and then the water got higher. And as you probably noticed, I'm fairly short. So as the water got higher and higher, it came to about chin height and I was wearing a full length abaya and I had a sort of dress suit underneath, which wasn't a great combination. And um, I later realized the places where I thought I was walking sort of on the ground, I was actually walking on walls and in some cases on the roofs of certain buildings because the water was getting so high. And then so we were in the water for about three hours, swimming, wading, swimming till the end. And uh, these are the photographs that emerged the next day. But for me, it was a really formative experience in terms of I realized that I worked for a lot of governments overseas and I'd had a lot of fun doing it. I worked on, on some really amazing projects and led them. But at the end of the day, I wanted to actually be back home where the designs that I did didn't just sit on a shelf and gather dust, but actually made a difference to the communities that they were part of. So for me, I thought it was very much time for a change. And um, that brings me on to the next chapter of what I did. So some of these are the projects that I designed and led during my time at HOK, the international architecture firm that I was talking to you about. So that's a project in Bahrain. Uh, you can see the sort of rather mad office towers there. Um, and then this is where I actually ended up, which is Whitehall. So I left my architecture career to go into uh, a slightly long name, strategic asset management, whatever that means, which basically meant looking after 354 billion pounds worth of property within government and deciding what we did with them. And I had a huge, huge portfolio. Uh, I like to say um, some incredible parts of government that I worked with in terms of defense, the foreign office, home office, but also housing. But to me, the part of my career that stuck with me most within government was working on this. So I presume most of you know what this building is? Tower. Yeah, exactly. So the last three months before I left government, uh, I led the non-social housing side of uh, Grenfell Tower, which was effectively, what do we do in hospitals and schools, but also on the housing side to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And for me, having come to this country from a different place, sense of home and a sense of safety is really, really important. And for me, it was really critical as part of government to make sure that the legislation, the building codes are going to be placed in the future that something like that doesn't happen to anyone ever again. Because frankly, in the kind of country that we live in, these kinds of accidents shouldn't be happening. So on the lighter note, one of the reasons I've always been excited about a career in property, but also in surveying, is for me, it's like playing with one of the biggest Lego sets ever. You've probably noticed a bit of a theme around Lego here, and um, I'm a bit, you know, I'm a big fan of it. But it's, it's the ability to build anything you want from the tools that you have at your disposal. And then finally, when I left government, I decided I wanted to be back in the private sector, seeing whether I wanted to uh, pursue a private sector career. And I ended up in uh, Lendlease, as you heard, which is a big Australian company, leading about 12 and a half million uh, square feet of office development. And one of the schemes I worked with is just across the water from here, which is Millennium Mills. Um, but I worked on a large number of other exciting uh, projects as well. It was a great fun job. But why did I decide to change back? As I said, become boomerang, as you mentioned, and come back into the civil service. 
is I felt actually at the end of the day, it was you know, great working on projects like this and seeing them delivered. But at the end of the day, I felt for me, there was something much more immediate in being able to change the way government thinks about property than being able to create change on a larger scale. So I hope some of you in this room will consider becoming a surveyor or going into a wider property career, because I'm sure, uh, even if you're slightly slumbering here, maybe a few words have percolated through, and you know, there might be the next star architect in this room. There might be the next head of international development for a big property company. You might be the people who write the next building codes to make sure that Grenfell doesn't happen again. Whatever you decide to do, there's a huge range of options. So thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you very much, Sharon. And I think um, what, what I found interesting there is uh, Sharon was not didn't do a property course particularly, but did an architecture course. And she has been able to use those skills of the built environment, which we heard a comment uh, on a bit earlier, uh, and her knowledge of design and everything else to take into a, a slightly different world of government, then with development at Lend Lease, now back to government. Um, she also talked about some enormous numbers, 350 billion, did I hear? You know, it's very difficult to get your head around that number. It's enormous. And you talked about a big office building. Uh, how many mi million square feet? 12 and, a half. 12 and a half million square feet. I think we, I think we tend to throw out numbers. And uh, we're not very good at sort of explaining what that may, may be. But um, let's have a think. There's a new office building in the city going up at the moment. I think it's called 22 Bishopsgate. It's the tallest one. It stands quite a bit above the shard. It stands up above the cheese grater. And that's well over a million square feet. It's not two million, but it's a million square feet. So when we're talking about 12 million, that's obviously 12 times the size. So that gives you a bit of a handle on the size. And in terms of value, there's a big building in Canary Wharf that's recently been sold. I think it's the Citibank headquarters. That's a big building. It's one of those towers. And that's been sold. In fact, it's been bought by Citibank. For the moment, until they complete it, they've been paying rent. And they decided they don't want to continue to pay rent, but they want to buy it off the owner. And they've paid over a billion pounds for that. So when Shireen's talking about 300 billion pounds, government property, that's 300 of those towers. Wow. Anyway, um, on to the next one. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to Jesse. Um, Jess, Jesse is more involved in residential. We've heard a lot about offices. We've heard a lot about shops and things. But he's going to talk us through his experience. And again, he has been at... Uh, the College of State Manager, and that's why he's got that tie on. Over to you. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Good. Um, good morning to future leaders from Newham. It's nice to meet you all today, so thank you for uh, letting me come. Um, a career in surveying isn't always a first choice. I can tell you that I didn't choose this sector initially, but now that I'm in it, our built environment is something that you can bring more change to than I ever imagined. And a career in surveying is literally life-changing because you change a place and a home or where you work. And we forget how important a home and a place can be to our well-being and our happiness. We take these things for granted. So I'm really pleased to be here to talk about a career in surveying today. And yes, I'm Jeff. And I'm making a bit of noise that away slightly. I've had a career in the built environment for the past 15 years and I'm delighted to be here to talk to you. If I do anything today, I hope that I can share with you some of my own mistakes, some bumps along the way, but to inspire you into what's been a fantastic career for me in this sector. And for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to tell you about my journey, give you a bit of a day in the life and tell you what skills I think will be needed in the future. That's where I remember to do this. I've done this with a bit of a racing analogy. Anyone, any runners in the room? Great. So um, we all know what the starting gun is. I saw, I saw life as a bit of a race in 2001. And I wanted to get off that start line as fast as possible but I really made it a bumpy start. 
I left home with nothing thinking that I'd be absolutely fine. But I quickly realised that I was homeless and hopeless. But thanks to a very kind grandmother's sofa and access eventually to the affordable housing sector, I managed to secure some accommodation with the YMCA. And this is where life changed a bit for me because after making some silly decisions, the YMCA taught me about paying bills, being more adult, and getting into work. I suddenly grown up realizing I'd taken the long way around if I wanted a successful job in any sector. So I'll talk to you about my first lap round that track, first go at adult life. It was 7.30 a.m. on a freezing December morning in 2004, and I was laboring out on site. I was 19, and I said to myself, was this it? Am I now an adult? I'd been convinced by the carpenter that I work for to go to the builder's merchant to collect three of the following items. A skirting board ladder, a tub of elbow grease, and a long wait. And apparently I had to be quite patient for that one. So much to the amusement of the depot staff, I'd been stitched up. Unfortunately, I'm not still waiting. But it dawned on me it was time for a change. And in my race, I needed to change the pace. I was grafting really hard and getting a low wage with little job security. And it was clear that it was more of a long distance run than a 100 meter sprint. I dreamt of a more successful life, but I didn't know how to realize it. And I was always looking for the easy way. But I hadn't given up. And I wanted something more. And I didn't want, I wanted to prove a point. So I knew I needed to go the distance. I needed to plan, work hard, do it over a sustained period of time rather than sprinting and burning out. I knew I needed a better strategy. And when I stand here and reflect on my position in that running track, it helps me think about why I love my career in surveying and why I think you should consider it. I realized three things. I wanted to have more impact. I wanted to work with people. I wanted to be seen as credible so that I could be successful. I wanted to not be the chap that was sent to the merchants for a can of tartan paint. So with my newfound ambition, I thought, I know, I'll be a boss. And it didn't work very well. I wasn't earning respect. I wasn't yet being successful or becoming credible. You know that expression, if at first you don't succeed. Thank you. So I tried again. I needed to change it up. I needed to set a pace differently again. I studied surveying and construction with the UCEM. I got the bug for it. I finished my degree, I became chartered, and I went to do my master's whilst I was in a full-time job. I'd already realized I didn't want to be a boss. I wanted to be a leader in the surveying sector. And I realized that I became successful when I made others successful. I just needed to think about that carefully. So we're running in the track, and we're starting to take the edge. And having the edge meant a focus on people. That meant becoming a coach, investing in people, building networks, and always learning. Anybody heard of Sovereign Housing Association? Yes. Have you? Great. Sovereign provide 57,000 houses for 130,000 people in housing need, aiming to build 1,900 new homes every year. And we operate in the southwest of England and the Isle of Wight. And my role as head of asset management is to be responsible for the strategic management of all of these properties. And the day in the life for me, just the other day, I bought 100 properties in one deal. I was presenting new standards of affordable housing to my executive team. Just recently been working on a big IT project. But most importantly, I spend a lot of my time taking the time out in the day job to bring people on the journey with me and to give context direction and vision to support people through a lot of change in our sector. So you ask me what skills and qualities I think we need from surveyors in the future. And it's great to be stood in a building like this, 
this building is, um, uses 70% less carbon emissions than comparable buildings. So it's a great place to be talking about energy, carbon emissions. But they're so important that I'm going to come back to them in a moment. I'm going to make a commitment that this is the last presentation I do when I talk about Brexit. Because it comes up too often, it's taking too long for us in terms of business planning to work out what we need to do. And we're thinking very carefully about that. In my sector, in the affordable housing sector, have you heard of welfare reform? Yeah. So welfare reform makes us think very carefully about our income as a business. And we need money to be able to build new homes for those people that most need them. And our customers have growing expectations of a modern, digitally connected home and place of 2050. And we have to start thinking about those. And equally, our businesses need systems and IT that works very differently to the way it used to. Does anybody know who this lady is? This is Dame Judith Hackett. Does anybody recognise that name? So we, we mentioned Grenfell Tower earlier, and Dame Judith Hackett provided a report to the government on building safety review. And that sent real repercussions around our sector in terms of making sure that our homes and our places are safe. Crikey, I'm, I'm, I'm done of time. Oh, OK, we're going to move to a question. Who did you see, or which person did you see in that last set of uh, pictures? Was it Drake? Greta Thunberg? Jeremy Corbyn? Or Jennifer Lawrence? So you got the answer right, mainly. Um, why have I talked about Greta? I talked about Greta because I want to revisit energy, and carbon, and the importance. Issues of climate change are so important for surveying. Our built environment is a massive part of our overall e ecosystem. And I don't know if you knew, but I'll give you two stats. 45% of our total greenhouse emissions come from heating air and water in existing buildings. And 87% of those buildings will still be here in 2050. We know from the recent UN climate change report that more than 500,000 land species do not have enough natural habitat to ensure that their long-term survival. And that, for me, are two really important messages for why surveying is so important, so that we can do our, our work really well and make sure over the next 30 years, if you get into surveying, you're able to make a difference. So, I'm finishing here. It's the finish line. I've told you my story. Stuff happens in life. <coughs> Challenges, difficulties, love and loss. But the more you put in at a younger age, the more prepared you will be for adversity. And what I do, I've told you about what I do and what my day job looks like. And whilst my sector doesn't always look stunning from the outside, once you're in it, it is an incredibly satisfying career. And I've told you that the types of skills that I think will be required and I want to make the point that these will prepare us for a vision of 2050 and beyond. So please go and plant seeds for trees, whether you get to sit under them or not in the future. Thank you. Jesse, thank you very much. And that's, uh, so that's the end of the sort of presentations that uh, the colleagues have been sharing with us. Um, and we call it work because, you know, there's quite a lot of hard work involved. But one of the things I love about property, and uh, we heard Jess talk about it earlier, was in a networking sense, you just make so many friends and have such good fun. So the chairman of the University College of State Management is this chap at the front, Mr. John Galatly. He's the guy with quite a bit of bling around his neck. Um, but I, we've known each other for 25 years or so. And we were working at competing firms. And even though we were up against each other, we developed a friendship. And it's very lasting. And the, you, you develop a big group of friends and contacts. And uh, as I say, we describe it as work. We're lucky enough to get paid. 
and we get some wonderful experiences as well as friendships and connections. And we're constantly learning. I've just learned a lot today about um, what, what our friends here are up to and, and what they specialize in. So now it's your chance to ask a few questions. I've got a, um, a rather fun microphone that I'm going to chuck around. Um, so I hope your catching skills are good. But anyone, do please ask a question. It doesn't matter whatever it is. We'll do our best to answer it. And I think minutes, we'll see how it goes. But we've got, we've got a bit of time. So uh, anyone for a question? Thank you. Hang on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chuck something at you. I, I saw you said you were an athlete earlier. Can you catch? OK, you ready? Yay. <laughs> yeah, just talk into it. See if it works. Oh, oh. oh wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, my question is, um, you know how you guys are all like surveyors and whatever? Um, is, there <laughs> is there anything that you regret in your career? Or is everything all like wishy-washy good? <laughs> Great question. Great question. Can I... Can I can I be really cheeky? Um, from my own, uh, own point of view, what I regret now is that I, had a, I wanted to go down one particular route. And I said, I just want to be that type of surveyor. And that's all I've done. And I've learned a little bit along the way. What I really wish I did was to do what Jess is experiencing, which is to move around departments, pick up a few skills, get some experiences before finalizing on it. For me, it's the same. But also, I regret not um, looking at all the different types of surveyor you could be. So I'm doing commercial property, it, it, you know, in commercial property, but I wish I'd um, looked at what a building surveyor is, what a quantity surveyor is, um, what a rural surveyor is, and I really wish that I had explored those options first and then made up my mind um, and decided what route and what type of surveyor to be done my research basically. Sure. Um, yeah, no, th thank you for being the first um, question asker by the way, so yeah. that's cool. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't think actually any career or any profession is ever that smooth and there's always down bits as well as up bits, so definitely sadly not all wishy-washy happy. Um, for me it's uh, probably sometimes listening to other people in terms of what they think that I ought to be and what I ought to be like. Because also, probably as a woman in property, I think as a woman in, in a lot of careers, people tell you that you should act in a certain way and not say certain things. And definitely at the beginning of my career, I was much more um, aware of that. I just ignore it now. Oh, okay. <laughs> wait, wait. Also, it was highly inspirational what you all said, but I want to know from your uh, like <laughs> level of expertise and intellect, so... <laughs> <laughs> what what type of um, surveyor do you think is highly like recommended? Okay, you better chuck the microphone back whilst. Uh... <laughs> okay, Je Jess, why don't you have a quick go? Jesse, have a quick go at that. Which which area do you recommend? Uh, well, area of surveying. Um, I, I've, um... I've been fortunate in that I've been able to do some similar stuff to Jess and had a range of things. Um, what do I enjoy? I enjoy the surveying that um, leads to leadership and um, being able to take those paths. Now, in, what's interesting about that is I think um, probably not right right person to answer the question in that I think you can take so many different ways. You don't have to make a wrong decision here. You can just make a decision. And with surveying, you can, you can move and you can shift and you can change and you can change the pace um, and change the strategy. Just start. That's what I would say. Go out, get work experience, because you're not going to be able to find what you want to do until you start to experience it. And for me, that was how I knew that I wanted to do what I do now through experiencing it. So go out, and most most companies, you know, if you if you email them, if you get in contact, pick up the phone, they will give you work experience. Um, and yeah, it's, it's. I think that's the best way to find. Um, I like. What I, you're I, most interested in. I like. We did at Reading. Yeah. That part, what's it called, yeah. Path? It's called the Pathways to Property yeah. Summer School, and it's open to um, 
open to year 12 students, so I'd highly recommend doing that as well. Okay, next question. Right, now that's a long way. I'm not sure, I'm gonna cheat. I'm, I, I'm coming up, you ready? You ready? Oh! <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't very good. Okay, far away. Wow. <laughs> um, you know, if you like take the apprentice route, do you basically not get a degree in university? Uh, no, yes, you do. Oh, do you? You sure about that? Yeah. Well, I was, I was saying, okay, so if you do the apprenticeship route, you 100% get a fully um, accredited degree. It's the same as going to university, you're just not going to university and 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 leaving home you just work as well it's exactly the same degree you just work you just do it part-time and work as well at the same time yeah what okay no, nothing i like about the apprenticeship route is jess jess was telling me that she'll be fully qualified if everything goes well by the time she's 21. if you go to university that's a three-year course and then you do two years of, so you'll be 23. can i have it back <laughs> Not bad. Right, next question. Okay, go for it. Um, no. What is your favourite part of your job? Sharon, would you like to have a go at that? Um, favourite part for me is, is the variety. I love actually doing lots of different things and being involved in lots of different projects. But for me, probably the most important thing is I don't like everything to remain theoretical. I love the fact that at the end of it, either a building is built or something is different, whether it's a policy or whether it's some, a structure. So that to me is the most satisfying bit. How about you, Jesse? Um, watching people grow and develop and improve themselves. Definitely. Great. Okay, let's have that mic back. Well done. Oh, no, not quite. Right, who's next? Coming over. Hey, well done. Basically, my question is, um, to be a surveyor, do you have to, like, um, for A-levels, did you have to do, like, maths -y subjects and science -y subjects? Because I'm, I'm not a great fan, but I am a fan of, like, geography. So, like, great could you question. do... No, no, like, could you do geography and, like, get away with it? Because geography is kind of... It's you. Jess, what do you reckon? The best thing about it is that you don't have to do any set A-level at all. You can do whatever you're interested in. So I did at A-level philosophy and ethics, sociology and business studies. And um, when you apply to university, whether you decide you want to go to university or do an apprenticeship, whatever A-levels um, you have won't matter. So do what you want. <laughs> Okay, right, next question. Ready? <laughs> Go for it. What's your top piece of advice for someone thinking about a career in surveying? Surveying. surveying. Okay. <laughs> okay, check that. I think you said surfing. Shireen, are you happy to say that? Uh, great question. Never ever take no for an answer. Nice. Jesse? Uh, from, from my perspective, um, I talked about when I was a boss and I, I, used, to, I used to take things personally. Um, and as soon as I stopped taking things personally, I think uh, that's, when, that's when things got easy and, and more enjoyable. So don't, don't take things personally when you get into the workplace, definitely. Okay, hands up. Anyone else? I like a challenge. That's a long way up there. I'm, I'm coming your way. I've always wanted to be one of those... Who was it? There you go. Okay, go for it. Ask the question. Hello. So, <laughs> so how, how much do you get? Talking to you. So, so how much do you get paid for like your apprenticeship? <laughs> that is check yeah. That is such a good question. Um now, let's have a think, because uh, 
a lot of, a lot of the big firms they're competing with each other i think for talent and for graduates and so they must have pretty similar bandings so can you give us in, any insight on that um, jess I'm, I'm, I'm happy to tell you. Um, so if you do the apprenticeship route you will start on 15000 and then as you um, progress through the four or five years your salary goes up every single year and then um, gradually going up every year. And then um, when you are a fully qualified charter surveyor, you will start on at least 35,000 pounds. I'd say that's pretty standard. Wow, yeah, yeah. I'd say it's standard for okay. most firms, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's right. And then it all depends on where you are, what you do, and how you work your way through the system. Okay, next question. We've got time for another two or three. Okay. I'll chuck it in your general direction and one of you catches it. <laughs> Go for it. Let's have a question. Uh, my, quest my question is, um, if you weren't a surveyor, what do you think you would be right now? Can you repeat that? If you wasn't a surveyor, what do you think you would be right now? Oh. Well, I can tell you I'd love to be Lewis Hamilton, but, you know, I, I haven't got the talent, I'm afraid. What about you? Jess, Jesse. It's, it's a great question. I'm not sure I've ever thought about it. <laughs> um, I know. Um, I probably would have stayed working at, uh, at the trades and, and tried to tried to keep focused on some carpentry or some trade background because you know that's a good career and I knew I wanted to earn money. So. Okay. Yeah. I, I actually had two other career choices before um, I, I finally settled on architecture. So when I was in my mid-teens, early teens, um, I initially wanted to become a diplomat, and I was really keen on doing that. But I was told because I wasn't born in this country, I couldn't do it, which I later found out was rubbish. Um, and then my other career choice was that I wanted to be a lawyer, but I wasn't doing Latin for GCSE because I loathed Latin. I was doing German instead, and I was saying, no, no, you have to do Latin. So in the end, I went for architecture, but I felt I made the right decision. Jess, what, what, what else would you have done? Um, I have absolutely no idea because when I was at school, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, and it was only that I went to the summer school and surveying found me as a career. So I literally have no idea. Thanks. Okay, last question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it down over here. Make it, make it a good one. Here it comes. Oh, wow. um, Go for it. So I was wondering how your job allows you to balance your social life as well as your work, or is it all just work, work, work? Something. <laughs> Jesse, do you have a social life? Isn't there a song called Work, Work, Work? <laughs> Um, it can be challenging at times, and it, it goes up and down. I think generally, um, it's about the organisation you work for and their approach. Um, surveying can be a demanding career, but if you find the right organisation, they respect that a work-life balance is really important. And I think one of the things that will be expected of um, the future generations will be a, a strong work-life balance, and organisations are waking up to this, definitely. Shirin? I, I definitely had much less. Uh, work-life balance when I was an architect and I frequently worked till quite late mm. 11 o'clock um, really early morning flights to different parts of the world um, but actually since becoming doing other parts in the property industry and also I think becoming more senior and realizing that you don't need to follow somebody else's rules I've been very very clear about what I like doing before I come to work so I want to drop my son off at school so therefore I don't usually accept any meeting in my diary before quarter past nine because that's the time I'll usually get into work. I like to put my son into bed, so I will nearly always leave uh, the office sometime between five and six. But then, you know, after my son is in bed, I will do a bit of work just to catch up with emails. But it means that because that's the way I run my life, I expect people in my teams to have the same freedom to be able to say how flexible they want to be as well. Great. And Jess, you must be incredibly busy because you're learning a new career. You're studying with UCEM. Uh, do you get any time to yourself and friends? Um, yeah, I haven't completely lost all of my friends since I started <laughs> working. Um, I think it's it's a balancing game and it's about managing your time when you're a student and working as well. 
I mean, yeah, it is going to be hard, but it's it's never been so hard so far where I can't go out on a Friday night or enjoy myself at the weekend. Um, it also depends on your work ethic and how hard you want to work. Um, but no, you definitely will have a social life if you, uh, I think, choose most careers in life, to be honest. Brilliant. OK, we're going to draw it to a close there, but I would like to thank you for being a very... No more questions. <laughs> very engaging, very animated audience. Great energy. It's great for us. I'd also really, on your behalf, like to thank the panel. Now, as you know, when you, from school, when you've got to hand in projects, you've got to do a PowerPoint presentation, it always takes quite a lot of work. You've got to use up your spare time. And I know that each of these people here who've got very, very busy day jobs have given up time to give the presentation, indeed, to come and join us today. So please join me in giving them a big vote of thanks. Thank you.